Oh my goodness, that was too much fun. Uh, if you ever wonder what pastors do during the week, you're like, what do you guys do all week? Uh, that's what I do. I hang out in the mall and talk to people about their greatest fears. And I actually had some pretty incredible conversations after the camera went off with a few people. It was really powerful. October is kind of the month where it seems like our culture features fear. I don't know about you, but it seemed like when I was a kid, it was more like cartoon-like things that you would decorate with. I mean, there are like life-size demonic-looking things all over yards in my neighborhood. Uh, it looks like straight out of horror movies. I don't know what is happening, but things have just gotten a little scarier, I feel like. Uh, speaking of horror movies, how many are old enough to remember when horror movies came out like once a year, right? Like in the fall. But last summer, as I was wearing pink and going to see the Barbie movie and the sun was shining and the birds were chirping, there were horror movies out last summer. It's like an all year long deal. It's probably, uh, I don't know what's happening. We seem to feast on fear, don't we? And uh, if, if movies aren't bad enough, uh, it seems like the newest trend is the true crime podcast, right? Because everybody, because truth, you know, what is they say? Uh, truth is stranger than fiction, right? Uh, so now we're following all these true horror situations unfold that actually happen. Uh, there's a guy in the Bible, his name is Gideon, and he faced some pretty big fears. What is your greatest fear? What is your greatest fear? I woke up this morning. It was about 5.15. I had my alarm set at 6 o'clock, and I thought, you know what? I can't go back to sleep, so I I'll just grab my notes and kind of look over my notes before I get up this morning. And so I'm laying in the pitch dark. I turn down my, my brightness on my iPad so it's nice and dark and I don't wake up Greg. And I'm sitting there reading about this message on fear, and I feel something crawling on my arm. Oh, it gets worse. It gets worse, Mitch. So I kind of swipe it away, and I'm thinking, oh, did I imagine that? You know, that happens, and you're like, did that really happen? Is there any? And then I feel it again, and I'm like, oh, no, there is something. So then I'm jumping, at, and then whatever it was starts flying, and it's like in my ear, and you hear this buzzing sound. You know that sound? So by that time, blankets are flying. Greg's still sleeping. I mean, he never even woke up. He's like, I guess she can deal with it. I... I finally grabbed my phone, and you know those big, huge mosquitoes you see outside? It was straight up crawling up my arm and then ended up in my hair. And then I got my slipper, and I was pounding that thing. And it, sorry, it didn't make it. It didn't make it. Uh, but I thought, here I am preparing a sermon on fear, and I am scared to death just laying in the dark, having creepy crawlies crawl over me in the dark. Um, fear is universal isn't it? I, I don't care how old you are, how young you are. I don't care what color you are. We all face fear. And I don't know about you, but my fears, they kind of changed over the years, right? Remember when I was a kid, I could never sleep with my arm over the side of the bed, right? Because something might be under there, right? And it might be, it might grab you. And then I remember growing up a little bit, going to school. Then, then it was kind of like fear of my reputation. You kind of just you know, you fear, what are people saying about you? I lived in a small town, so, you know, that was your reputation was everything. And everybody knew everything about everybody. Then you got a little older, go to college. You're like, oh, man, how am I going to pay these bills? How am I going to afford to pay off these school loans, right? Uh, and it just seems like our fears just graduate, don't they? They kind of evolve to even bigger fears. Now today I'm like thinking about my grandkids that aren't even born yet in the crazy world that they're going to be born into. It just seems like there's no shortage of fear. And fear often hides inside, right? Uh, I love what the famous children's author, Andrew Clement, says. He says, fear doesn't need doors or windows. It works from the inside. How many know it's true? God knew that uh, fear was an issue 500 times in Scripture. Fear is mentioned. And over 300 times, we are told in some way not to fear. God knew repetition was the best teacher and that we were going to face some fears. 
How many remember Taylor Swift? Any Swifties in the house? <laughs> Come on now. My daughter loves Taylor Swift. In 2008, she came out with her Fearless album. Did you know that that one stayed on the top 100 billboard for over a year and topped the charts in three, three other countries? There's something that strikes a chord in all of us about being fearless. So what happens when our fear meets faith? Did anybody, when you were growing up in school, maybe elementary school, maybe middle school, you created those volcanoes, you know, those little science experiments, right? It was more fun creating the realistic-looking volcanoes, but what our teachers really wanted to teach us is what happens when two active ingredients meet, right? And we all know it was baking soda and vinegar, and then it would just have this explosion and reaction and got oohs and ahs from the whole classroom. Well, what happens when faith interacts with our fears? There's this real-life story of Gideon who uh, is going to give us an upfront and personal view of what happens for the next few weeks. We're going to dive into the story of Gideon and what happens when our worst fears meet an all-powerful God. So we find Gideon facing his worst fear. He was an Israelite. He lived during a time when God had appointed judges, hence the book of Judges that we're going to read this story about. And Gideon was actually the fifth judge to serve, and he was responsible for the people. It was an important position, but the people had rebelled against God, and God is kind of, he's not unlike us in our parenting styles. How many try to teach your kids that their actions have consequences, right? Uh, I remember, you know, uh, telling my kids as they were going out to school, you know, make good choices, you know, all of those little things. I remember one time I was leaving for work, and my five-year-old yelled after, after me, Mom, make good choices. I was like, thanks. I'm going to do that today. So they were paying attention, right? Because our, our actions have consequences. Well, God's people had rebelled, and there were consequences for that. So uh, the Midianites had come in. They were kind of bullies, and they were taking over, and they completely raided God's people. And this is what happens in Judges chapter 6. It says, they left the Israelites with nothing to eat taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, donkey. This is all the stuff they were eating, right? Kind of they raided the refrigerator. These enemy hordes coming with their livestock and tents, they were thick as locusts. They arrived on droves of camels, too numerous to count. They stayed until the land was stripped bare. And so Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. If you've ever been to an impoverished neighborhood or an impoverished country, you have a better understanding of what it would be like to live in the nightmare of starvation. Here in America, I, I've never considered myself a rich person, but I remember traveling overseas, and I'll never forget the moment that I saw a baby that couldn't have been more than two years old laying naked on the sidewalk, not moving, and people were just walking past like nothing was happening. I don't think to this day I had a more heartbreaking and helpless moment in my life. How many would agree a worse nightmare for any parent would be to hold your baby while they cry and they're starving and there's nothing you could do about it? In the U.S., we say when we're starving, we usually mean, hey, I want some Chick-fil-A. That's usually what we mean when we say, hey, I'm starving. But according to the United Nations, 690 million people around the world suffer from chronic malnutrition. And listen to this. One out of eight kids in America goes to bed hungry. One out of eight. Starvation is probably the worst fear I could think of for my family. But this is where we find our friend Gideon. He's sitting there. His people are starving. He's in charge, so... Guess what? When you're in charge, guess whose fault it is? It's your fault, right? They were weak. They were helpless. They were outnumbered. I don't know. I faced a lot of fears in my life, but nothing to this magnitude. Gideon was a man of faith, and his country was in crisis. So he was wondering, God, 
where is God when your worst fears come true? And he was about to find out. You ever been there where you're facing a fear and you're wondering, where is God in this moment? This is what Gideon did. It says in Judges chapter 6, verse 6, Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. How many know when you're going through hard times, it's probably a good idea to ask God for help? (laughs) In fact, a lot of times I teach people to say this simple prayer. I'm like, when you don't know how to pray, if you don't know what to pray, just say this simple three-word prayer. God, help me. Sometimes that's all we need to do is cry out and say, God, help me. Now, many of us, we're used to running to the phone instead of the throne. You know, we, I believe in counselors. I believe in friendships. I believe in networks. But sometimes there's situations that we get ourselves in that only God can get you out of. And when we, when faced with the deepest fear, Gideon knew who to run to for help. God help me. So after he prayed, something happened. How many know after we pray, usually that's when something happens? Because prayer moves the heart of God. And when God's heart is moved, and then his hands are moved. So listen to what happens. Judges 6. It says, Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat in the bottom of a wine press. Put a pin in that. We'll come back there. You're not supposed to thresh wheat in the middle of a wine press. You're supposed to press wine in a wine press. But he's hiding the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Now, most theologians, they agree that the angel of the Lord was God himself. Others say that it was an angelic messenger. Uh, But regardless, it was a supernatural visit from God with a message. And notice that God meets Gideon in the middle of his fear. Even though he's in hiding, the message says, wait a minute, you're a hero. Here he is hiding, and the message says, wait a minute, you're a hero. Your fear doesn't scare God. It's not his reality. Fear may be your circumstance, but faith is your reality. Come on, somebody. God was giving Gideon a reality check. Fear kind of reminds me of VR. Anybody have those cool VR? Little goggle glasses, whatever they call them. Often fear is kind of like that. It's false evidence appearing real, right? We think it's there, but it's not. I mean, I put those VR glasses on. I was kicking stuff. I was just, you know, going all over. Nothing was there, right? It was all virtual. The reality is what God sees in you. You might be terrified and in hiding, and God's going to show up and speak to you and change your reality. What are you going to believe when God speaks? You're going to believe your fears? Are you going to believe God's proclamation of reality in your life? When God meets us in our greatest fear, he reveals his greatest hopes for our lives. Think about this. In his worst moment of his life, hiding and starving, Gideon realizes that he's actually hearing the best pronouncement he's ever heard. God is saying, hey, you're a hero, and you're going to save the Midianites. The Lord is with you. You might think it's your worst moment when you're hiding in fear. But what if it's the best moment for God to speak to you? Sometimes I don't think we stop and listen until, we, until fear sometimes gets our attention, right? Here's the story continues to unfold. Judges 6, let's read on. This is his reaction. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. You know, when God speaks to Gideon, Gideon has some questions. Now, I don't know about you. Some of you are new to church. Some of you grew up in church. Some of you were born on the front row of a church. Some of you don't even understand what this whole church thing is yet. No matter where you're at, when I was raised in church, you were kind of taught that if the Bible says it, that settles it. Shut up and listen, right? But when I read the word... People weren't afraid to ask the hard questions. 
Gideon wasn't afraid to say, yeah, but, but God, where are you? And why is all this happening? Why, God, why? When, God, when? Does it sound like some of your prayers? Ever wonder why God seems to be answering other people's prayers and not yours? You're on the highlight reels on social media, and you're looking, and you're like, man, why did, why did they get the new job? Why do, they, why do things seem to be working out for them? And here I am just praying for this one thing, Lord. You know, God doesn't expect us to be perfect, but he does invite us to be authentic. It's okay to bring your hard questions to God. It's okay to wrestle with God a little bit. Some of you don't look too convinced. Don't forget where Israel got its name. We're watching Israel in the news, heartbreaking. But listen where Israel got its name. It's got to, you've got to go all the way back to Genesis. It says, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled, some versions say wrestled, with God and with humans and overcome. Israel got its name by wrestling with God. It's okay to wrestle with God and ask him the hard questions. He's big enough. He can handle your questions. And here is how God responds to Gideon's questions. He doesn't tell him to shut up. He doesn't tell him, hey, I said it, that settles it. He goes, the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength that you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like we got a, a perspective problem. I went to my eye doctor a few weeks ago. Uh, I was running out of my contacts, and they're like, oh, well, how are you seeing up close? And I'm like, well, you know, there are some days where I'm like, you know, things up here, I just kind of, I'm not. And they're saying, well, you're getting to that age. I'm like, what? What age? What are you doing? Who? I'm like, who are you talking to? You're getting to that age. She's like, yeah, you might want to invest in some reading glasses, you know, just at night, you know, when you're looking. And I'm thinking, oh, no, she didn't. Just tell me. But I needed somebody else to tell me, hey, sometimes you got a vision problem. Sometimes we got a vision problem and we need clarity. And sometimes fear distorts our vision because we get so consumed with looking at the realities around us that we don't look at the reality of the God who's bigger than every circumstance. Everything I have ever done worthwhile in this life has been the result of stepping out in faith and not staying stuck in fear. Because here's the reality. Fear paralyzes us, right? I mean, you know, if you're afraid, you usually don't want to move, right? And that's why they actually tell you, you know, when you're out. And some, who was afraid of bears? Somebody was talking about bears this morning. You know, you're supposed to, like, not run, you know, like when you encounter a wild animal, don't run. So maybe that, that fear thing is kind of a good, helpful mechanism, defense mechanism that we don't run. But fear paralyzes us. And if we stay too long, we'll never experience what God has for us. But here's the thing about faith. Faith propels us. He didn't say, hey, stay, hang out here for a little bit longer. I know it's rough. I know it's been hard. He didn't coddle him and tell him to stay. He told him to go. Faith is a verb. God is always telling us to keep moving. In fact, the very word church comes from the Greek ecclesia, which means the sent ones. We are the sent ones to bring the hope of Jesus to the world. Amen? Amen? Right. Say it like you believe it, church. Help me out. It's been a rough morning. I was attacked. Come on, help me out. He says, go in the strength that you have. You know, some of you have been convinced that you don't have what it takes. You don't have the strength. You don't have the stamina. Maybe you don't have a certain gifting. But God is like, no, I've given you everything you need. My life first, his divine power has given us everything. Say everything. Everything you need for life 
and godliness through the knowledge of him who's called us through his own glory of, and goodness. God has given you what you need. Don't talk yourself out of it. God is saying, hey, go in the strength that you got because we're not going to be paralyzed. We're going to be propelled. Gideon has a decision to make at this point when God makes this announcement and tells him to go and the strength he has. And it's really a decision all of us have to make. And it's not just a decision. You know how sometimes you make those big decisions? And they're just one-time decisions, right? Um, I, I only decided once who I wanted to marry. I didn't want to have to do it again. I realize sometimes people go through a couple marriages. But I would, that was a decision I only wanted to make once. But can I tell you, deciding to follow fear or faith is a daily decision. It's a daily decision that we have to make. It's kind of like the air we breathe. We need it every day. Gideon was facing his worst fear, starvation, a nation on the brink of starvation. He was failing as a leader and his people were starving. Will we ask God for help when we face our greatest fears? Will we ask God, God help me. There's so many places and so many resources. I was talking to some friends from Uganda, and they said, you know, Pastor, uh, when we lived in Uganda, when, when we had a physical ailment or something happened, um, we would just pray for it, and God would heal it. Like, it would go away. She says, but now we've moved to America, and when I have something wrong with me, I, I start Googling it, and I go to WebMD, and then I call my doctor, and she goes, and it doesn't go away. She says, I miss the days where all I had was God to help me, because he always did. God met Gideon in his fear. How many believe that, you know, even like the Taylor Swift album, Fearless, Sometimes we, we feel like we need to get a place where the fear is gone before we step forward. We're going to talk more about that next week. But God always meets us in the middle of our mess, in the middle of our fears. In fact, one of my Lectio Divina prayers is one of my breath prayers that I pray in the morning. I say when I wake up, God, here I am, the mess that is me. Here I am, God. And God is faithful to meet us in the mess. Will you invite God? Will you give God permission to meet you in the messes that you're in? I, I don't know what your fear is. A lot of times our fears, we don't, they're, they're so personal, we don't even have words for them. Sometimes we don't even share our greatest fears with anyone because we think, oh, I don't, I don't want people to really know really what's going on inside. But when we invite God, when we take the curtain and we say, God, hey, I'm not going to hide from you. What did Adam and Eve do in the garden? They hid. They hid from God, which is kind of funny, right? Because it was God who made them, and uh, God knew where they were. This was not hide and go seek, right? I remember one time, you know, my kid took off in the store, and they were playing hide. They thought it was fun. They play thought it was hide and go seek. I thought they got kidnapped, right? My, my, my brain, you know, went to the worst possible scenario, and they're like, oh, we're just playing. No, we don't play with mommy and hide and go seek in the mall, right? But we'll, we invite God in to our mess because that's where the miracles happen is in the mess. We think the miracles happen out there to other people. No, they happen to normal, ordinary, everyday people that dare to say, God, here I am, the mess that is me. Come and meet me in the mess. And then God asks him to go. Will you leave your fear so that you can live in faith? Well, will we leave that place of paralysis where we say, God, I'm so afraid, I, I just don't know where to go. And God is saying, no, I want you to go. I want you to take one step forward. Maybe you're for you, the step is just telling somebody what's been holding you back with your fears. Maybe they're big fears. Maybe it's fear of the unknown. I mean, sometimes there's, there's all kinds of fears. I tried to look up in the DSM how many fears there were. They said they can't count them all. There's just too many. There's too many fears. Between arachnophobia and all the phobias, there's just too many fears to list. But God asks Gideon, will you leave this place? Will you go? Will you allow yourself to be propelled forward 
by faith. Well, we leave our fears so we can live by faith. At some point, Gideon had to decide if he was going to get out of hiding and hope for more. And I, I love this, that the Bible, when we opened up, where did we find Gideon? It says he was hiding, threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, I don't have to be a historian to know that wine presses were not made to thresh wheat. You ever, like, get stuck and you don't, can't find the right tool? You know, like, oh, if I can't find the hammer, you know, I try to grab the screwdriver and use it. It never turns out well. Usually I end up hitting my finger, saying things that pastors shouldn't have to say out loud. No, I say, Jesus, help me when I get hurt. But the reality is that Midian had no business hiding in a wine press threshing wheat. And God's people have no business hiding in fear. You were not created for fear. You were created for faith. I'm going to say it again because some of you don't look like you believe it. You were not created for fear. You were created to live in faith. 